Welcome to a Mick, a Mick, and a Mike. Hosted by four-time Emmy-nominated producer Frank Bates and retired New York City firefighter, 9-11 first responder, and Vietnam vet Billy O'Connor. Today's guest, Gary Anthony Williams, fine actor from Night Court, a lot of other shows on television. My brother, my brother Frank, how are you, pal? How, how are you doing I'm today? Good, I'm doing good. Yeah, you're in a good mood this morning, I see. You're bubbly. Effervescing. I'm, I'm always bubbling. You're effervescing. I'm always effervescing. I'm always <laughs> effervescing. Our guest today, before we get into our discussion, is Gary Anthony Williams, fine actor, known from Night Court and a lot of other shows on television. Uh, well, we st- we're speaking of shows. Uh, what are you looking forward to seeing the new TV season? Do you know what's on? Do I know? You know, I, I don't watch a lot of uh, situational TV. I mean, I, I, well, this, this will be a good section then. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep talking. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I'm like, I'm like a senator. I don't know what I'm talking about. I was <laughs> run, for, run for office. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, I, I've been getting the. Did you see the uh, Sopranos special on HBO? No. That's I, really good. Is it really good? What? It's really good. It's, it's on HBO. Hey, Derek, how are you? Derek, my oh. brother, how are you doing? Pat? What? What? How you doing? Out of the black comes what? <laughs> wow. How you guys doing? We're doing, doing fine. Good, man. Did yeah? You Did you do your push-ups this morning? Push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> Push-ups. <laughs> Push-ups. <laughs> Every time I get the inclination to exercise, I lie down until it goes away. And that usually happens? I don't, don't want to deal with this stuff. Yeah. Hey, listen, man. I'm feeling young. I was in New York. I went to like a reunion. Everybody got old. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, what? Oh, just back to the Sopranos uh, yeah. situation. So you, it's good. It's good. It's really good. Really, it, it interviews David Chase. Okay, and he, it's, he's the main focus of the interview. But they talk talk to all the cast members, and they talk about what a wild man David Chase was, and how how insufferable he could be. And uh, really, it's, it's really well. It's a two parter. I didn't think Chase. You wouldn't think Chase would be kind of a wild man, you know, like you wouldn't. Well, he was. That's what he was. Complete wild man. Complete wild man. It's just that I'm doing everything his way. Well, that's not, that's not, I, 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 you would have to be a bit egotistical, I guess, to be an executive producer in Hollywood. I mean, talk yeah, to me. Yeah, well, you know, I've worked with a lot of people that are and a lot of people that aren't. And for the most part, the people that aren't uh, are less, at least successful, less successful. Yeah. yeah huh? I figure a show dies from the top down. Really? You know, the show has to have a singular point of view. It has to have a Diane English point of view. It has to have a Chuck Lorre point of view. It has to have a David Chase point of view because you, you have to have a person, right or wrongly, who takes a stand and makes a decision one way or the other. You know, uh, uh, my friend Howard Morris always used to say, uh, a camel is a horse built by committee. And in television, that's really the case. So you need an autocrat to make it work, and a guy who whatever an autocrat won't is. be deterred. What, 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 what's an autocrat? I mean, somebody who's going to make the yeah. singular decisions, and that's it. And he's not going to be swayed. He doesn't give a shit what you think, what yeah. this guy thinks. I, I, I mean, like Diane English, who will be a guest on a future podcast. Uh, always used to say, "I always want to hear what my my writers say, uh, and if I disagree with him, we'll go with what I think." <laughs> yeah, so, so it's like it's like Lincoln. With the, with the nine people give him an opinion, yeah. he says, oh, "I want the other side. It's unanimous." <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. Well, that's uh, so, so David Chase. That David Chase interview is is really special, really good. And I, Derek, are you still watching The Sopranos, or have have you? Watched? No, I finished. Did you finish? Yeah. Are what they, did you think of the ending? They I'm talked. Sorry. They talked about the ending. Uh, ooh. you disappointed? Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's hard to end any show, you know what I mean? Because technically, think about if you think about life itself, the endings in life are never the way you want them to be. So I can't imagine that a show ending would be something that you would want either. Billy, you know? if you went on on top of a uh, your yeah. wife, you would, you would have. <laughs> I like the way you're rephrasing <laughs> these questions. <laughs> I like the way you're rephrasing these questions. You get me on the wall. Yeah, I you know, know, you know, know you what know, I'm saying. It's you. funny how he said he was like, if you went on top of a uh, wife. <laughs> 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 If, if, you went out, if you went out howling at the moon, go out in the saddle. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you wouldn't be unhappy, would you? How, did Rockefeller go out like that? I don't know. I wasn't there. That's what Rockefeller <laughs> supposedly his wife's name was Happy. Right. That was his name. Wife's name. Yeah, Happy Rockefeller. And Nelson went out in the saddle. That's how he went out. He went out happy. Yeah, Happy Rockefeller. And both of them were happy at the moment. <laughs> 
until she pushed him off. Yeah, I guess that's the best way to go. You sleep, I guess, and you even sleep. better. Yeah. You know, I just don't want to listen. Nobody wants to suffer. That's it. Nobody wants to be sitting there dribbling, looking out the window, you know? Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> we've, we've, talked, we've talked about that before. Oh, so let we've me talked ask, about that before. So. so let me ask you something about Chase. Did, has he done uh, outside of the Sopranos? Oh, well, he's done since then. He's done whatever he wanted to do. Before then, he was just a writer uh, and a writer on Rockford Files and worked for Stephen J. Cannell. And he had a lot of credits, but he thought that The Sopranos was his last chance. He, wow. he just wanted to write movies, and if he didn't hit on The Sopranos, and he, The Sopranos, at the time he pitched it, there were only four networks. There were the three big networks and, and Fox Network, which was fledgling, and they all passed on it. And then uh, Chris Albrecht at HBO saw it, and he said, well, I think, I think we got something. And, and Chris was a good guy. I, I mean, I've known Chris for 30 years. Um, and Chris was you know, a major figure in the documentary. So it was, it was fun. So was, was HBO just a fledgling network at the time? Yeah, they, they, were doing, they, they were doing sports. So they were still home box office. Yeah, they were still home. Well, that's, that's what they Yeah, H I know, HBO's, but I mean, yeah. but now everybody, I, I, yeah. I used to call it home box. I mean, it wasn't too long ago. Yeah. I was still calling it home box. Yeah. Was, you know. And oh, yeah. they, they showed all the people uh, auditioning for Tony Soprano. And ironically, one of the guys who auditioning was our friend Peter Onorati. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's right. He would be a, a likely candidate for that. Yep. But uh, again, the feed was amazing. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think I heard uh, this the guy who played Christopher. What's his name? Uh, Anthony. Yeah. Uh, Chuck Poldy, whatever. Anthony. Yeah. Uh, I'll think of it. Well, anyway, he had said that. Uh, Mal yeah, Maltesani, Christopher Maltesani. Christopher Maltesani. You know those kitty names. You can never keep up with them. I, I Imagine know. a vowel. You know, I, I know. Just slow it along. It's not, put, it's not like putting O in front of any everything. <laughs> or Mick. Mick, <laughs> Mick Mattis. Mick, Mick. Mick, Mick Sherry. Mick this. Uh, yeah, but he had said that he, that he was so intimidating that, uh, I mean, you actually thought you were talking to, to, to a mob boss. You know, he was so good at it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's a great story about uh, Billy Van Zandt's brother, Stephen, uh, how he got the job. Uh, Chase literally saw him giving a presentation at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and he said, "That guy's an actor. I want him." Yeah, he was like dressed in a zook suit with a well, rug, he, right? He was dressed like one of the little the mobs, ras one of the rascals. Oh, is that what he did? Like one of the young rascals? Yeah. 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 Well, I think we have beat this up around enough. Look, can we get a? I'm going to check that show out. Yes, please do. Uh, can we get a hold of uh, Gary Anthony Williams, my friend Derek? It's possible. It's possible. Let's see what we got, ladies and gentlemen. How do you, you look for the new season? All these shows are still up, good, running. Oh yeah, oh, uh, <laughs> here he is. Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> Gary, how are you, my friend? I'm good, brother. I'm good. There's this my friend Billy O'Connor. How are you, Gary? Nice to know you, pal. Hey, Billy O'Connor, good to see you, brother. And Derek Harris on the on the controls. Help. Oh, uh, oh, oh no, Derek, did he faint? He fainted. Oh, okay, he's back. How he's, you doing? I got worried about you, Derek. I mean, I saw, I saw what just happened to you. Yeah. I didn't know. It was a I, I make a lot of I make a lot of people weak in the knees, so I understand. <laughs> <laughs> it's a curse, ain't it? I know what you mean. It's a curse. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah not much. Yeah, yeah, not much of a blessing, but more of a curse. <laughs> I, I see you got that recording studio set up in your house. I gotta make all this money. Yep. I don't have a choice, so I gotta, you know. Well, you gotta, you've had a pretty good career, I might say. And you, you know, you, you may be one of those perfect careers where you're making money, but you're not too famous and you can walk the streets. Yeah, but I keep, you know, when I walk the streets, I have on that T-shirt that says, hey, I'm Gary Anthony Williams. Here's my name. <laughs> <laughs> You'd rather be a little bit more famous then. You don't really need the anonymity. Yeah, no, I don't need that stuff. Uh, yeah, no, it's been good, man. I'm having a good ride and, uh, you know, things slow down, things speed up, but, uh, it's, I, I, I could complain. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to start complaining. No, okay. I have nothing about it. I have. And, and I now, have, and right. now you're appearing regularly on night court as judge. Yeah. Flobert. Yes. It's, it's, it, 
labeled a judge, he rarely <laughs> does keep judging. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of a do well. This just, just, I love it when I remember one day John Larroquette and I were sitting in the makeup chair and he turns to me and he goes, uh, Gary, I keep forgetting to ask you, uh, what the fuck do you do here? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Gary was bought in on the second season, the first or second season, to be a substitute judge. And we liked him so much, we couldn't have him be a substitute judge. So we said, yeah, fuck it, we'll just keep him around with Flaubert. <laughs> so he, he can be a judge, he can be a bailiff. Yeah, yeah I've, I've been a, What I've the been fuck a, do you do? I've been a clerk on there, I've been a lawyer, <laughs> I've been a. It's the same guy. I'm just like, you know, yeah. Well, what is, yeah and and you start, he started the season in the first two episodes or something uh, because we had we added Wendy Malik to the cast. But Wendy Malik had a, a, another job, so we couldn't get her till the episode three. So we said, ah, just keep Flaubert as the judge. So yeah. <laughs> Flaubert was the judge as well. Right spot at the right time, man. That's it. Yeah, man. Major yeah. Mark. Well, That's literally and, my life right there. And he does funny. Boy, is he fucking funny. Him and him and his scenes with John Larroquette. Killer. <laughs> I, I mean, so I, I, I saw that we had a, a, an episode last week where there was a scene with him, John, and Lacrita, who's been a guest. Yeah. And I, it was like the World Series of Comedy. I mean, it was so freaking so fun. Funny. And I, you know, I, Larroquette and I started together on, uh, we were both on Boston Legal at the same time. So I've known that dude for a while now. Did he recognize uh, you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because you yeah. lost what hundred pounds or so. I lost about anywhere between one hundred and sixty and one hundred and eighty. What? Anywhere between one hundred and sixty and one hundred and eighty. You lost yes. Billy. Uh, Shit. Uh, yeah, I lost you, man. You lost your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> I am rich. I have very heavy money. Um, how did that? How did yeah. how did Boston Legal come about? Uh, Boston Legal came about in the, it was crazy. I had never seen the show in my life and I was out here in LA and I was working and I was working a lot and I'm from Georgia. So I was like, I'm tired. I want to go home for a week to Georgia, see my family. And my agent called him with, Hey, uh, Boston Legal wants you on an episode. And I was like, no, they say, it's just a single episode, but it's a really good show. And I was like, no, nah, I just want to go home. Uh, <laughs> and then I told my buddy about it, my buddy uh, Scott Ward, and he goes, Gary, that's a really good show. And at that time, you couldn't really like go on the internet and look at an episode of anything. Right. Like, it just wasn't possible. And he's like, Prom I promise you it's a good show. So I, I, I go to do the first show. As, Cla like, as Clarence or Clarice or both? I, went, I came in as the female, Clarice. And, uh, but when I went to like the very first day, they were like, you're just going to be a dude. You're just going to look like a guy, but you're wearing a dress. But then as I'm sitting in the makeup chair, the day of the first taping, they were like, no, you know what? We're going we're gonna to make you look a little nicer. We're going to get some nicer clothes for you. You know, we're going to do your makeup a little bit more. So it was just full blown up beauty makeup on me. Um, and after that first week, the, make, the hair guy goes, hey, get, you know, I was only there for one episode. And the hair guy goes, you're going to be a regular on this show. And I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, I see how things work here. You'll be a regular. Watch. And then after the um after that episode aired, David E. Kelly called and said, Hey, you wanna wanna be a regular on that show? I was like, Are you kidding me? Of course I do. Yeah, so that's where you started to this pattern of one show turning into a regular. That's my plan. That's that started your plan. <laughs> every every guest actor on the show says, Well, I'm gonna be one show I'm coming in for one show, but I'm I'm, I think they're going to make me a regular, but Gary, that actually happens. It really to happens. Yep. Well, let me ask you a question about that because I, I think that's that's something we don't get to see as as an audience. Uh, you're the producer, Frank. Obviously, you're the actor, Gary, and and so it's just guys, a word. No, we, that doesn't happen very often, and um, because it doesn't happen very often, how does it happen, Frank? Like, does it happen because he's just a standout talent, and it's just um, like. It's he's so undeniable when he performs that uh, you it. as a producers that's it just can't you know uh, it's in the history of show business it's happened a lot you know Mimi in the Drew Carey show wasn't a regular uh, in uh, what the hell's the name of the show uh, th th there's a few cases where I mean I, I don't think Fonzie was a regular in he oh, wow. he, he made wow. himself a regular what's the name of that show 
I want to, uh, the, the whiny voice kid in uh, fa- Family Family Matters. Oh, Urkel. 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 Okay. Yeah. Urkel wasn't a regular. So, you know, this stuff just happens and it's all comes down to the actor. Well, let me ask Gary. The actor and gambling bets. Like, uh, Frank lost a lot of gambling bets with me. I did. So. I did. <laughs> I did. Frank, if I didn't know you had a problem with gambling, you should call me. It's, it's not a problem me. for me. <laughs> not a problem <laughs> at all for me. I don't, right. I don't want my wife to hear this. <laughs> so what is it when you? What is it about it, the unmistakable talent? Like you yeah. show up, you make an impact, you make a mark, and people want to hire you. They want you to be back, you know, do more stuff. Uh, is it because, and let me ask you both this question, is it because the camera just likes certain people or you have an unmistakable, you know, uh, air about you? But- I, can't, I can't speak at all from Frank's side, but I know from my side, like all I want to do is, I, my whole purpose in life is seeking joy. And all I want to do is do as fun a job and as good a job at whatever I do as I possibly can. I don't worry about what's happening next, what's happening four years from now for me, five years from now. I want to seek joy in the moment that I'm in. And if that plays on screen, great. If not, then I move on to the next thing that I want to find joy in. I can't speak at all from Frank's side. No. Well, that, that's exactly my philosophy because every time I took a show, I said, I want to do the best job possible. If, 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 every, if, if people don't like what I'm doing, they'll fire me. If people like what I'm doing, they'll rehire me. So I just want to, I'm not trying to make everybody happy. I'm just trying to do the best job that I can do. And if I do that, I'll succeed. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, that and if sure. not, I'll move on to the next show. And you like what you're doing. So yes. You, so you, it's obviously you're going to be better at it. Yeah. But so that's almost like a method actor. I mean, in a way, like you want to just be happy. You want to enjoy what you're doing. And hopefully that shines through when you're on stage or when you're in front of the camera. Or on stage. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Well, how much how much of that comes from your improv background? Because you've been a regular on Whose Life Is It Anyway, or you're currently yeah. a regular on that. How much yeah. does your uh, imp- improv background work into what you do on, on Night Court and other shows? Well, I think it all plays into each other. It's, I think it gives you that uh, just that feeling of freedom, no matter if you're doing scripted work or not. Like, you know, I do plenty of shows where it's just scripted. And there's no lingering, you know, there's no good going off the path. Like Boston Legal, like you never went off script. And even in this show, we stick to the script. But within that, it still gives you the freedom to, to create. Um, so definitely a lot. Yeah, I started doing improv comedy and I was a stage actor first. So I started doing improv and Shakespeare at the same time, professionally getting paid for it back in Atlanta, Georgia. So I attack it from both of those places. Like, you know, I did a lot of classical theater and then a lot of just free form improv comedy as well. So I make sure everything that I've done in my past, I get to play around with a little bit on projects. Improv takes a lot of chops. I mean, I, I did some stand up comedy for six or seven years, you know, after I got out of college and I got out of college late. I was like 65 when I first went on stage, you know, uh, and started doing stand up. Wow. And I took some improv classes because, I mean, that just helps you in everything, I would imagine, especially I mean, your business. Every, you do so many diverse things. I mean, you do voiceovers, yeah. you're doing acting, serious acting, you're doing comedy, you're doing this and that. So improv has got to be like like unlocking. I, I, I would tell anybody from any actor, director, producer, like honestly, taking some improv classes and just realizing the freedom there, even the freedom within confines, like it really is super helpful. It has helped in every part of my career, from the voiceover stuff, from the on-camera stuff, from the dramatic stuff. It it it's like a secret little tool in your weapon that's always there for you. Yeah, I, I tell every all producers to take an acting course, take a lesson in actors. Yeah, they they should know what an actor is going through and what an actor's thinking and how an actor minds work. You know, and I think that's beneficial to any producer. Yeah. Uh, and for years, for years, I ran a, a, a film festival here in L.A. called L.A. Comedy Shorts. Mm-hmm. And I used to produce a lot of short films. And then um, Disney hired me for a while to produce some uh, TV stuff for them as well. And it's so helpful also on that side of being a producer of something. Uh, and then as an actor, like understanding more like 
what the camera needs from you at that moment, what the director is looking for in that moment. It's so great. If, if you get a chance to do all sides of stuff, it gives you definitely a dynamic way of looking at things that, than if you only grew up doing one thing. And not to mention the fact that it makes you more available, I mean, to, to make money in, in your profession. I mean, the more things you can do, the more diverse you are, the more likely you're to get called for parts. I would imagine Frank is always just saying, if you want to be an actor, learn this, learn that, learn the, all sides of the camera, do what you take as much information as you can get. Yeah. Why, like, why not? Especially if it's something you enjoy doing. Why not? <laughs> Give yourself that opportunity. So I always say in this business, you got to get lucky. Uh, is it true that a computer error in high school put you in a drama class by accident? One hundred percent true. One hundred percent true. So <laughs> I was uh, I was always a super smart kid. I was like a smart, lazy kid. Um, and I had I needed to burn some hours, and I was like, oh, I'll just sign up for this thing, like learning how to work lights, like lights, you know, behind the scenes thing on stage. And the computer class put me. I mean, the computer. <laughs> Uh, era put me in a drama class and I was like, oh, this is dumb. I'm not going to act. And I get in there the first day and her name was Robin Bennett, still one of the greatest directors I've ever worked with. And she, she's like, okay, tomorrow I need you all to come back with an original mime piece. You have to, and I'm like, what? This is stupid. And so I was like, I got to get out of this class. So I, I came, I didn't, I refused to think about it that night. Then I came back the next day and I created this original mime piece for her, which was basically something to get me out of her class, which was <laughs> I, did, I, did, I was going to be a father who just watched the birth of his child being born, looking at it lovingly. And then basically I prepare the child for dinner and I, I basically roast this child and eat it. <laughs> and I finished the mime and she goes, that was excellent. That's an A. And I was like, wait. The thing that I tried to do to get out of here, <laughs> I can be stupid and dumb and offensive and ridiculous. And she's like, that's creativity. That's an A. What you just did is an A. And I was like, wait a minute. There might be something to this. And even still after that, I started acting in high school plays. And she would do, for a high school, I mean, she would do like Bertolt Brecht. She was serious about herself. That's where I first started doing Shakespeare. She was she was not joking around with with theater. Uh, she was I don't know what she had done wrong in life that she wasn't a Broadway director, but she should have been way more than a stupid high school director in Fayetteville, Georgia. But um, even after that, I still try. I was like, well, I can't make a living acting, so I would be like, no, I like science. Let me do some of that. Let me do uh, psychology, you know. But I just kept coming back to acting after that. Funny how a good teacher can make an impact on your life and just you know change your whole life. The right person at the right time, just yeah. She made all the difference in my life, and, and like I've had several friends who popped along along the way that did the same. My friend Tommy Futch, uh, before I ever did any improv. In fact, here's a lesson, Frank. I was in a, I was in college, and um, where did you go to school? I, I went to this tiny little school in uh, in Clayton County, Georgia, called Clayton State College. It was just a, a junior college that's now a four year college. But I was super poor, and I could afford to do it. So I went there, and uh, south of Atlanta. So this big time guy comes down from Atlanta to teach a one day improv class. Uh, and after the class, he pulls me aside and he said, "You shouldn't do improv. It's not for you." And I was like, oh, whatever, dude. And, and <laughs> the next year, I left school and I had moved up to Atlanta. And the first person I got cast in a show to do was with that guy who had just told me that I shouldn't be doing wow. what I'm doing. That's so, so funny. yeah, yeah. I Man, I can't listen to those people. They don't no. know what they're talking about. I mean, the, <laughs> amount, the amount of stories that you hear from people, you know, that are successful that have been told that exact same thing. Yeah. Just and I think... I think you're either going to listen to them and it's going to affect you in the, I'm going to run towards the thing they told me I can't do, or I'm going to run away from the thing I can't do. Or you're going to do like me and go, whatever, dude, well, nothing you said makes any impact on my life at all. Yeah. So. And again, many times the person making the uh, evaluation 
doesn't have the ability to make the evaluation because they never they never succeeded beyond a certain level, and yeah. you're you're aspiring to do way beyond the level yeah. that the person is doing. Yeah, I, I I don't think most people can can honestly tell people what they are capable of. <laughs> like it, it, that's not a gift that most people have. You do not know what someone's yeah, capable. I would think in your business, it's always going to be a crapshoot. I mean, some people know. I mean, look at the Fred Astaire's famous screen test. The first screen test Fred Astaire had. They said, "Can sing, can dance a little." Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, who, yeah. I, I, I'm actually, it's, it's. Would you say both is? It's an exception to the rule that you can look at somebody on stage and say, "Well, that guy's got it. He's going." Or is that an everyday occurrence? I, on stage, you can, but you know, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of your background. What made you say, as a firefighter, I want to run into a burning building to save lives? I mean, I, I can tell you right now, I couldn't do that. No. So, Would you call that heroics, Billy? I call it peer pressure, <laughs> 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 and that's a true story. I mean, when you're in a when you're at a job, you know, you're going. It's almost like being in combat. Not that I experienced a lot of combat, but Vietnam is similar in that you're going because you're not fighting for your flag, you're not fighting for your country. At that moment, you're fighting for the guy next to you, and it's yeah. the same thing in a fire. If you're in a fire, you know, if the other guy's going down that hallway and he's going to go down twenty feet more than you're really comfortable of going. You're going down that hallway with them. Wow. You're eating with these guys. You're sleeping with these guys. You ain't go back to the firehouse and say, hey, what happened to you? you know, like, that ain't happening. <laughs> oh, wow. So there's a lot of peer pressure. You know what I mean? But yeah. but uh, I've never know. heard that described that way, man. That's amazing. Well, that's definitely true. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, <laughs> I tell you, well, I, uh, I want to get back to you. I want to ask you a, a question about, uh, I noticed, well, a lot of things I want to ask you. But uh, one of the things when you were uh, in the factory with John Cusack, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Made a, and then you made another movie with Cusack, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Yeah. Let me ask you, how does that work, both of you? Is it like because you worked with a certain guy and uh, you got had a good relationship with him? Obviously, he'd rather work with somebody that he likes than somebody that doesn't work. Or is it going through the producer? Or does it does it help you that the, that the lead actor likes you or whatever? You know. I mean, I look at movies like John Wayne always made. He always had uh, Ward Bond and Big you know, Big Boy Williams working because mm -hmm. they got along good. And, and, you know, John Ford did a lot of things. Is that the same way with today in today's business? Well, I, I will say for me, like, Cusack is not the example of that for me personally, but Cedric the Entertainer is more the example of that. Like, I did one of his shows, and he's he's one of those, he's one of those actors super funny and like if you bring the funny then he just wants you around more he's not worried about being overshadowed which some actors have that weird thing about like oh, that guy can't be funnier and more interesting than me cedric is like bring all the funny you can to anyone so with him that relationship with him led me from one of his shows to another show of his shows for sure just from like liking to work together like liking to be around each other and and making each other laugh yeah. I can definitely say that for Cedric, for yeah. sure. With actors, it's not so much a <clears throat> relationship with a guy like Cusack. It's it's more coincidence that uh, Gary did uh, two movies with Cusack. Where it is, is with directors and producers. Uh, you know, a director like Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood always works with the same people because he's comfortable. He works with the same camera guys. He works with the same DPs. He's comfortable with them. They speak his language. And he knows he, he can depend on it. He's got certain actors that are in all of his movies because you know he's comfortable with them. So Yeah. Well I would like just that, that's definitely a good camp, like that Cusack camp. And like on T V, like the um on the improv side of T V, the guys from Reno nine one one, they're very much like that. Like right. they will hire someone, they get used to you, they know you know the language, and then you end up doing whatever project they have coming down the pike because yeah that, that like you just said they, it's a shorthand at that point and they can trust you and you can trust them uh J james <coughs> earl jones recently passed away yeah were you intimidated by having to replace him as the voice of mufasa the lion in uh no, no you know what i was <laughs> so Here's how that happened. So there used to be a kid's show called Special Agent Oso. 
and it was this little bear by Sean Astin uh, was the character, and his his boss was this watch named Mr. Dose, and I did a James Earl Jones type voice for it. Hello, hello, Special Agent Oso. It's Mr. Dose here. So that producer, going with what we just talked about, his name is Ford Riley. He created that show. Then years after that, he said, hey, I'm doing this new Lion King for TV. It's called The Lion Guard. And uh, I just need uh, to do a sizzle so they can see what it's going to look like. Will you do a James Earl Jones voice for it? Of course I will. I'll do anything for you for it. So I did the sizzle. They liked it. James liked it. So James did then the first episode of the Lion Guard TV show. And after that, he turned it over to me. He only wanted to do the pilot. And then after that, he had heard my voice in that. And Ford had heard it and Disney had heard it. And so they all gave me the okay to do the rest of the episodes. But what I would do every time, uh, because nobody is James Earl Jones, but every time before I did an episode, I would have them play me some of James's voice because I don't want to try to be exactly him, but I definitely want to put it in that emotional place where he was and the depth where he was with it. Uh, so it was definitely, it was more an honor than a fear because I know he had already like okayed, okayed yeah. that and everyone else had. But now that's like to be Mufasa, the only other Mufasa along with James Earl Jones. Come on, that's, that's, that's career stuff, you know what I mean? That's like, wow. And by the way, it was only about six years ago when I went, I was in a voiceover booth before I had a booth at home. And I was like, oh my God, I'm a professional voiceover actor. I just realized that one I had done, I don't know how many, over a hundred cartoons by then, I'm sure. And I was like, oh my God, I'm a professional. And I've never thought of myself as a professional at anything in life. That's funny. Hey, I, I saw James Earl Jones on an episode of Sesame Street when all he did was announce the alphabet. Wow. So can you do a little bit of James Earl Jones doing the alphabet, Gary? I, I can. I, I can. Uh, I usually like to hear his voice right before I do it, but I can at least go into a bit of it. <laughs> a. A is for Africa, Simba. That's where you belong. B. B is for the baboons of Africa, Simba. Where everything the light touches is their kingdom. C. Um, I, I can't think of anything that begins. <laughs> That's improbable. That's great. <laughs> That's great. No, I love that, dude. So, like, literally every time before I would record, I was like, let me, let me hear his voice. I want to get that right timbre because it's important. He's, the crazy part is he's never as deep as I think. He just has this beautiful round tone. And uh, just very measured and careful with every one of his words because he grew up as a stutterer, as I'm sure you both know. So he took a lot of elocution lessons to get rid of that stutter. Right. So it comes from his stomach like an opera singer. I heard he was a very gracious oh. man. Very gracious. I, I've never met anybody who met that guy who did not love him. So, yeah. He, we used to live a few blocks apart and I didn't even know it. I should, I should have gone and beat on his door <laughs> <laughs> while he was... How did Uncle Ruckus have come about? Oh, Uncle Ruckus. Uncle Ruckus from the Boondock. Um, I was a fan of the Boondocks uh, comic strips in the newspaper. Like I read, I still read comics every week. I love comics. And, um, and then I bought all of the books of the Boondocks written by Aaron Magruder. I had every single big collection that he had ever written. And then my agent called and said, hey, they're doing this cartoon called the Boondocks. I was like, this is my favorite comic strip. And she said, well, they're auditioning for it. And I, I said, I want to audition for every male character on there. The granddad, the two brothers, the neighbor, every male character. So I go in and I, I'm auditioning. And the creator, Aaron Magruder, is at the back of the room. And, um, and they're like, well, there's this new character uh, that's not in the comic strips yet. We want you to audition for him, too. Because the other stuff I auditioned with, they were like, okay, cool, cool, cool. And then they showed me a picture of the new character and they described him. He's like this big, heavy dude, self-loathing. He hates all black people. He's black himself, claims he's not black, uh, has every job in the county, uh, and just praises white people. No matter how horrible they are to him, he just praises them. And I go, in my mind, I was like, oh, man, 
I knew these people growing up. I grew up in the South. My dad had these friends who would come by on Sundays wondering why he didn't drink anymore, you know. And I was like, I know that attitude. I see that picture of him. I know where his voice is. So it came from a mixture of my dad's friends who would hang around who for some reason didn't seem to, some of them didn't seem to like other black people and just that picture of him. So when I, when I saw him just moving around all late and slow and praising the white man for all the beauty they have done to this world. Oh, thank you, white man, for building the pyramid. <laughs> and let me tell you, that. Care, in, in fact, as soon as I leave you guys, I'm driving down the riverside and do a bunch of signings right now uh, at this comic book store. That character, I think I started that character 20 years ago. They tried to bring it back a few years ago, and one of the other leads died, uh, John Witherspoon. But I have never seen anything like it won't go away. And now that from nine years old up to 70 something, the fan base in that character is like nothing I have seen. I thought it would be dead and gone by now. And it is by far the most popular cartoon character that I've ever done. And, and now because of YouTube and TikTok and Instagram, it's, it's literally bigger than it was 20 years ago when, when we created that. That's crazy. Are you, are you allowed to do stuff on TikTok in the, uh... Uh, uh, but, yeah, okay. Wow. Great question, brother. So I was doing a bunch of, uh, uncle ruckus songs. I love making up song songs. Okay. And on the show, I started making up songs on the boondocks and I started making them up because one day Brian Cranston and I, when I was on Malcolm in the middle, we were just sitting around talking. He goes, Hey, you ever notice how much I hum? And sing little ditties on the show. It's like, yeah. He's like, that's because every time I create a song on the show, I get paid by ASCAP, the music <laughs> union. <laughs> uh, like, yeah, yeah. That's lovely. So if you're ever on a show, try to hum, try to sing. <laughs> the, the very first episode I did of the Boondocks, I made up a song called Don't Trust Them New N-Words Over There. I made it up. I improvised <laughs> the whole thing. Then they put music to it. So I just started singing all these songs on the boondocks. Anytime I got, I sang a little ditty and now I get paid. I still get paid every single month from ASCAP. So uh, yeah, last year or so, I started doing TikTok with Uncle Ruckus and I would make up all these songs. And then my phone rang and it was Aaron Magruder. And I was like, ah, oh, I told my girlfriend, this is it. He's going to tell me to cease and desist. So I pick it up. Hey, man, how's it going? Good, good. How's your son? Great, great. Yeah, yeah. Hey, the stuff you've been doing on TikTok? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's like, oh, make sure when you do that, make sure you tag me. Like, all he wanted to <laughs> do <laughs> tag him and to tag his merchandise company, the Boondocks Bootleg. He's like, that's all he wanted. He's like, yeah, keep doing it, man. <laughs> like, that's great. So he, he, because he also hired me once to write a bunch of songs for the Boondocks for, as Uncle Ruckus. Uh, the ones I didn't improvise, he paid me to write. Uh, the company did, rather. And so he totally trusts that I have the voice of that character and that I don't screw it up. Oh, so he has never, ever once said cease and desist. All he's ever said is do more. And he's always trying to create new products around that character. I got a question for Derek. Growing up in Mississippi, did you know a bunch of Uncle Ruckuses? Uh, it was... Uh... I was holding myself back from actually, you know, <laughs> sub subscribing to having known people like that as well. So, yeah, it's, it's rough, man. It's unreal. Like, yeah. you know, like there's regular folks and then there's those guys walking around. And I was like, but my dad was like me, like he's not going to discredit somebody for being a friend because they're an idiot. You know, he's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, idiot. Like, idiot friend. So he had a couple of those around. Right. Some of them were very ruckus voice, but one guy, his name was Mr. Candy, Candy Walker. And Candy Walker would come around every Sunday and sit with us for a couple of minutes, but he was always espousing how great the white man was and just telling us how to be friends with them. It was the weirdest thing. Like, if you shake hands with the white man, you <laughs> shall become friends. How do you... What are you doing, dude? Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Sanctified place. I, I got a I got a request. Um how long yeah. do we have? How long do we have you? Well, we got until Gary wants to go. You Yeah, I, I probably uh, I think about fifth I'm trying to find out like the comfortable time for me to Yeah. Okay, another fifteen minutes maybe, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. So uh, can we uh this I'm putting you on the spot. I'm also putting you on the spot, sir. Uh -huh. Um can we do a little improv? 
for a oh, second yeah. between Billy because I think Billy's got some comedic chops and a little uh, acting. He's uh, really putting prowess. me on the spot, right? So Billy, now, get, you, get yourself. Do you mind up. if I? Do you want me to go full Uncle Ruckus with it? I, so I want to do Ruckus. <laughs> I got, I got. So we'll do Ruckus first, and then I have two others. Um, so, um, uh, let's do let's do uh, hmm. let's do Irish men coming to uh, meet Uncle Ruckus uh, at church. An Irish man coming to meet Uncle. All right, come here, come here, come here, lad. How long have you been coming to this church, by? Oh, well, that place, about, this is my first time here, but I walked by the door and I saw all these beautiful white people <laughs> and all that beautiful white music, and I just know this is the place for me. So, so you're that enamored with us, are you? With the white people. <laughs> and Emma, and Emma, you are you're the original people. I, I know. They, oh, they invented Negroes in Africa. No, 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 no. The white man was clearly invented in Ireland. Ireland and Scotland, you can't get whiter than those two beautiful places. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your food is so delicious. What's more delicious from a white man than white food? Like, oh, a good white potato. A good Irish <laughs> Other folks ain't got nothing that tastes that delicious. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nothing like a not like a good Mickey, as they say. Uh, uh, just put that put that over the fire, by is enough to to, to to wet your whistle. You know, make you uh, 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 with a pint of Guinness. Uh, oh, 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 yeah. Uh, now no, look at look at uh, you, you know you know that I'm actually a white man, but I have a disease called revitiligo that makes me look dark. But let me just say this about. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I know, I know, I know, I know folks listening to this don't understand. They drinking malt liquor right now. But let me say this: if you want a delicious drink, nothing is better than a Guinness. It is a nectar of the gods, like mother's milk, by like mother's milk. Oh, nothing right. like it. No, no, no. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. no, no I, I'm sure right now some some black man is drinking a Cristal right now or kicking back a Schlitz malt liquor bull. Right? <laughs> if, he wants to, if he wants to find himself, find himself closer to reality, he needs to get himself a pint of Guinness. <laughs> now, I, even like how y'all, I even like how y'all done done in Irish. It's spelled P-I-N-T, which should be pint, but y'all say pint. Oh, y'all just got the fanciest damn languages in the world. <laughs> Terrific. Perfect, perfect. Just perfect. terrific. I, I got a question for you, Gary. I, yeah. when, you, when you do voiceovers, when you do auditions, how often do you walk out of that room saying, nailed it, that's mine, I got it, and then be dead wrong, Wait, Rob, the percentage of being right, right wrong? Uh, the, the wrong percentage is in the high 90s. Um, <laughs> only time, so crazy. the only two times in my life where I've walked out of a room and said I got that was, uh, was a small part I did in, um, uh, uh, the internship with Vince Vaughn only because as I was walking out of the room, he was having a battle between this other producer because Vince had wanted to use me in another movie and I didn't get that movie. And so he and his producer were battling this time and he brought me in and the producer brought somebody else in. And as I'm walking out of the room, so at, as we're rehearsing together, Vince and I are doing a scene together with scripts in our hands. At one point, he literally throws the script across the room to start improvising. And I drop mine and we improvise it. And then I walk out of the room and I heard Vince tell the other producer, I told you. And then I was like, oh, well, I got that role. And the only other role I've ever walked out of the room thinking that I had that I did have was Uncle Ruckus. Like the second I started doing the Uncle Ruckus voice and then just improvising him as him as him too, I saw how Aaron Magruder, the creator, changed. And I was like, oh, I got that role. Uh, That's the only other time. Other than that, I never even imagined that I have a role when I leave the room. It's one of those things like, did that, I tear the script up before I even leave the building and and move on to the next thing in my mind. Yeah, that's that's, that's funny because I was just the opposite. I always thought that I got the job. And oh, really? A, a lot of times I did. And if I didn't, I'd say that motherfucker didn't deserve me. So that's yeah. the, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the way I kept my sanity. Well, yeah. I, always, I always do say, well, they got to hire somebody. It might as well be me. But I rarely think I have a job when I leave. It's, not, it's just like, eh, well, we'll see. Yeah, so. it sort of helps you cope with the rejection i mean the rejection's got to be yeah you got to cope with I, it how, 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 yeah. however you can get through the to the next day i used to give myself frank i would give myself one hour to be mad at anything and that's it after the end of that hour 
it's gone, brother. Aren't like, you, and I'm aren't still you married? Way. Aren't you married? <laughs> <laughs> I'm no longer married, but I have a girlfriend now. Uh, and even that, it's like, you know what? This got to be, I can't be angry with you all the time. Somebody's got to cook food around here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I, I thought you were a pretty good cook, weren't you? I am. I'm the one who cooked the food. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I, I love to cook, man. What's and your specialty? Uh, well, you know, I'm a vegan, and I've been a vegan for, I've been a vegan since 96 and a vegetarian since 87. I grew up, we raised and slaughtered all our own animals. Uh, and um, so I grew up doing that, and I lost my taste for meat, like, super early in life. Like, even as a little kid, if I was thinking about what I was eating, I just couldn't eat it anymore. And so, um, so now it's mostly like we cook all kinds of vegan stuff enough to have a cookbook. Like we're putting together a cookbook, my girlfriend and I right now. Was that responsible for you losing all the weight? The, the turning uh, weight? not the veganism, uh, the low, I had to go low carb. I lo I went low carb and, uh, that the weight just came off. Um, but you can be a fat vegan. Like yeah. look at <laughs> Check out. They ain't gonna eat it. Yeah. Uh, I, I was living proof. You could be a fat. A pretty healthy vegan, but I was just still eating, and I never overate. But I would eat bread, rice, pasta, uh, potatoes. And I don't eat any of that. Frank will tell you on set. I have a very boring mouth. There's nothing exciting going on inside my mouth when I'm eating. What, what's uh, the what's the um, what's low carb uh, vegan? I'm curious about what what's the diet for that. Uh, uh, l let me let me see what I what did I have last night. Actually, I did have a, a pasta made from peas last night. I rarely do that. But um, it's vegetables, man. Like I, when I first started, anything I would have gotten at a Chinese restaurant, I still got the exact same thing, but with no rice. Okay. So it. it's, it's more the what I take out, which is no bread, no rice, no pasta, no white potatoes. Have you talked to Wendy uh, Malik about this? Because I think she's a pesca pescatarian. So, yeah, See, she, she looks. Oh, she look. She looks like she is. Like Wendy. Wendy doesn't weigh. I think she has an absence of weight on her. <laughs> she. She looks like what people would have thought a vegan looked like when I was three hundred and seventy or three hundred eighty pounds and a vegan. She looks like that. She looks the right way. I was a vegan, and people never would have known it. Um. Just and it was literally the second I took carbs out of my diet. Like two days later, I was like, oh, I'm not tired in the middle of the day. Yeah. That's before I even started losing weight. But the carbs were slowing me down. And I had, n I, had no I, I had no idea. If someone had come to me and said, you know, you'll lose 160 or 170 pounds if you're not eating pasta. It's like, what are you talking about? I don't overeat. And I never did. Still don't. But it was that was just holding it onto my body, man. It was the carbs, I don't know. The carbs, are no joke. carbs and the sugar, right? You gotta you gotta knock off all the sweets. Exactly. Too, right? I don't yeah. I don't I don't add sugar to anything. You know, I, I went out with a ballet dancer and she was the kind of girl she if you Are you she, bragging right now? No, 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 no. She, she totally is. She was an old ballet dancer, you know, she was a she, who haven't you a got geriatric out? ballet dancer. Who haven't you got out with? <laughs> she could <laughs> she could wink at you and she looked like a needle. I mean that's how skinny she was, you know. Oh well. I mean and and I and her big thing was she never ate anything cooked. Raw. She says, eat raw and you'll melt. I mean, that was her, her philosophy. You will also poop all day long. <laughs> <laughs> I, tried raw, I tried raw years ago. I tried raw when I was like 20 years old. And my, all I did was poop. Like, I didn't have time to do anything. <laughs> I had a calendar of <laughs> Time to poop. Uh, my, my girlfriend is the opposite. She can eat. I... I go get her bagel every day from Hank's Bagels, which is just delicious bagels, apparently, according to anybody who can eat them. Um, I get her bagel every day. She can eat as many carbs as she wants, and she is just a Pilates body thin. But, you know, some of us are designed that way, man. Yeah. I can't speak for all your old ballet girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> Not all. It was like, you know. <laughs> Did you date a ballet troupe? Was that your thing? No, no, whole? just this one girl. She was. She was... She was I like 60 when I met her. I mean, yeah. it wasn't like she was still doing ballet. Wait, how, how old were you? 70. <laughs> no. Oh, 70? When I met her, yeah. Six years ago. Seven years ago. Oh. How long am I married? Wait a second. Yeah, Eight, nine uh, years yeah, ago. Think, think, Eight, think nine about, years ago. Yeah, Sorry. Careful, <laughs> Ten years ago. Let me go. It was two decades ago at least. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't uh, going down that road. You uh, 
Use your math right. Use your math right. Let's start doing the Roman numerals. So with double X to go. Double X to go. Well, Gary, we're, we're, we're going to wrap up because I know you got to run. Uh, Derek, do you have any last questions for Gary? I... I, I think they're going to take too long. So um, <laughs> but, uh, next, I, I'm happy to come back and, and chill with you guys because as, and I know, you know, this Frank, like when you start talking about firefighting, there is nothing in my life that I could ever do. That's more interesting than people who can do the things I can't do. Oh, <laughs> so oh, like, that to me is like, I will, I want to talk for a freaking hour about that. Oh, Screw well, I, uh, I'll fill you in on Billy's background. <laughs> he, he was a Vietnam veteran, a wow. retired New York city fire department, a nine 11 first responder, yes. a bartender. Uh, what else? Uh, I did a little bit of everything. Bar owner worked a on bar the owner. rigs for a while. Bookie. But, oh, a bookie. Was a bookie. Yeah, it was a bookie. Oh, yeah. So Seven, eight years. We'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk you, about Billy. Did you say the? Did you say alcoholic? Oh, yeah, alcoholic, but, drug. alcoholic, drug addict. Yeah. And you don't get paid. You, that doesn't pay well though, does it? No. <laughs> and at, at the at the age of sixty, he went back to college and got his degree in journalism from the University of Florida. Oh my God! And then you said you started doing uh, stand up. Yeah, I started doing stand up in college. Started writing in college. So, yeah, it's been a good run, you know. Wow. So far, now I'm sailing, playing a lot of golf. Life is good. Uh, you need to sit your ass down somewhere. You need to sit down. Yeah, you're doing too much. You're doing too much. Do too much. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's amazing. Wow. Well, we can never get enough of you, Gary. And we, thanks for joining the show. Great meeting you, man. And hey, it was a joy working with these two beautiful wife. <laughs> and I, I am sorry you have to work <laughs> with me. Okay. <laughs> have a safe trip to Riverside. Billy Be Williams. well. Uh, I don't know who's ever said that in their lives, but I will. <laughs> Thank you, guys. This seriously was fun. Honestly, if you ever want to just get on and screw around some more, dude, that, that that's great. Great. We'll nice meeting you, Gary. Take care of yourself, pal. Thanks, All the Gary. Best. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Ciao. Great guy. Good guy. Funny guy. Yeah, very, very funny. The guy does, you can see the improv in him, just, he can just take off, you know? Yep. Yep. It's a real talent. They, 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 yeah, they you tell have... you these improv classes, they say, you know, like, you say something to me in improv, and then, and then it gets thrown in my court, and you say, yes, and. That's that's the two words, yes, and, right? And then you go from there and throw it back in the other guy's court. You guys did really good. Well, he carried it. All I did was go, you know. You, well, you, you started it with the accent, so <laughs> that was a good. It. He carried it. Uh, yeah, you're a great guy, man. Very nice guy. Good guest, Frank. Way to go. Thank you. You did it again. Hey, Billy. How many more friends you think he's got done? left in his closet? I, you know, quite a, uh, quite I mean, a lot. Of, I mean, he's been pulling them from uh, all. Yeah, he's been pulling all, them. I, I'm all recycling cor- some. <laughs> <laughs> all corners of the earth. <laughs> you know, Armour's got a new book coming out. He'll be another guest. Billy Van Zandt's got another book coming yeah, out. Yeah, he wrote another book, he'll too. Be, huh? He'll be we a guest. We do need another shot at Billy Van Zandt, actually. Wow, we'll have this. This will be the third. Yeah, I know, but we the, the, the first, first and first was great. Really count. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. It was good, but it was good, but, but we, we had uh, technical, technical challenges. Dishes. So we need one more shot. We'll we'll get uh, we'll get loose for that one. Yeah, Billy's writing another book. I saw that. He's got to come on. Yeah. Billy, I got a question. If you were to play, if you if if uh, if you knew a producer, and uh, he came to you and he said, "Billy, I have the part for you." The part that's going to change your life. What what would you what what part would you say that would be? Hamana 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 hamana. Probably some kind of sex stallion, I would imagine. Sex stallion. <laughs> Seventy six year old sex stallion, you know. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't, that's good come idea. on, come on, take a shot at Let's it. Let's see. What would I? I well, I like, guess I'd play a. Uh, a a guy dragged up a night court, a bronze bookie, or a fucking derelict, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or, 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 car- or the lead character in Combustible. Or combust- the lead character in Combustible, exactly. Yeah. That would be a hell of a plot. Exactly. I mean, it's the part, sir. The part. Yeah. Meaning it's, a, it's not a stretch. Well, it would be a little stretch for me at this age to be crawling into the buildings. But <laughs> no, we get a younger actor to oh, do yeah. that. And we'll just have you sit in a book. Well, wheelchair with a blanket you know, telling the story. Brad Pitt's 60 years old. He's a younger actor. <laughs> <laughs> I got a ball spot. I got a ball, ball spot, spot older than Brad Pitt. So is that line now. We've yeah, had, it's that, all we've had that line <laughs> so, so many times. What are you going to do? 
who would play you in a movie? I don't know any young actors. I don't know. Really? Really? Come on. Give us a Ooh, shot here. Come on. What happened? Well, like, with the with the beak, maybe Adrian Brody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I got the same beak, uh, you know. Uh, it wouldn't be bad. Yeah. I who who would well, of course, the, the ideal guy for me would be Killian Murphy. I'm a big fan of Killian well, Murphy because he's a talk boy. You know? Actually, that's perfect. Talk boy. Yeah. There you go. The movie's yeah. cast. There we go. Now we got to get this. Now I just got to get Killian on board. <laughs> 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 you can get anything made. That guy. Boy, that's he's for sure. a hot item, you know. That's for sure. It took a while though for him. Well, I takes, think Vicky Blind has really launched him. I mean, they really. Uh, I mean, if you think about, it, I mean, he's been working for a long time, but in terms of like, like he's sort of like a superstar now. From an Irish viewpoint, from a guy from the same place that he is, from Cork, uh, he made a movie called "The Wind That Shook the Bar." It okay. was one of his first. It was about the revolution, the IRA. Love, you know about how. Love the title. Yeah, the wind that shook the Bali, and uh, his accent is so. Old Cork. It's not the accent he really has of Cork, but it's the accent of Cork before the internet, before uh, before television. You know, before, right. like before it's, the internet. Yeah, un there. unspoiled Cork accent. Yeah. You know, raw Cork accent. And he does it. And it, I, and I was listening to it. And I said, "Man, this guy sounds like my father." You know, like, it was amazing to me you know, how, how how on the money he was with it. And it's a really good movie about the about the IRA and the revolution. You know? So uh, that's where I first became Murphy. You know who, who would be a good Billy O'Connor? That kid who played uh, Banshees of the Interior, the younger kid. <laughs> oh, the kid in that, in that. That was a terrible movie, right? I didn't like it, but some people do. It was I, beautiful. I it was terrible. It was beautiful. Yeah, what's his name? Uh, Colin, Colin Farrell? No, the, the young kid. Oh, the kid. I don't know. The kid. He's, a, he's a big star. I think he's dating now Sabrina Carpenter. Is that right? Yeah. So, but he would be a good Billy O'Connor. So, is that how we can pitch it, Frank? <laughs> yeah, young Billy O'Connor. Pitch it as a young oh, Billy O'Connor. Yeah, we we pitched it, and we we get the same thing. Oh, we've done too many fireman stories. Oh many fireman we've done too many fireman. Too many stories. period pieces is too, my favorite. Too many. Why can't they just say we don't like this shit? Because they can't say that because it's fucking a great book. Yeah, no, it's no, a great book. No, is a no, great book. it is. No, I'm not talking about to that. I'm saying to anything. You know what I mean? Like, what? What's the line of uh, "We've done too many of this"? Or oh no, the 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 answer now to uh, not being giving an answer is ghosting. Yeah. Okay. Ghosting. When it, whenever I mean, I found this. I found this so when I was doing my documentary, uh, Jacksonville. Who? You go and show it to some person, people, and they say, "We'll we'll get back to you. It's nice. We'll get back to you." And then it says, "Fucking ghost me." Even people I knew yeah. ghosted me. So how is that okay? Because that's it's sort of bled into the new generation. I, I noticed back oh. in the day because I've been pitching things for years. Um, it's like how what, why why do you think they've taken on this this new kind of uh, behavior of of the new because generation? they're used to dealing with the internet. And they're used to dealing with the text world, and it's a, it's a it's a non-combative industry, so you can be passively aggressive. Right. So that's the the biggest passive aggressive at all. It's, it's just, instead of saying "go fuck yourself," you say nothing. Right. It means the same thing. Yeah. So lame. It's equivalent to it's not you, it's me. Huh? When you break it up, it's like you know, you just go away. Yeah, just go away. Anyway, all well, right. that was a nice episode. Don't you just go away? Out there. Don't keep, you keep following? Don't just us. go go away. Correct. We got. Keep, we Keep zooming in. We still got some books. <laughs> we still got some books in the closet. Yeah, I saw a couple over there. <laughs> so if you want one, you want a couple of them. Oh yeah. my god! You know, there's uh, Confessions of a Bronx Bookie. If there's, these, if lips, these could lips could talk, talk. Lamar's Gamble, Combustible. combustible. Check all, them out. Open all them up. All good reads. All worth your time. You read the first page, you'll read the last page, guaranteed. It'll take you all the way through. With that, we'll see you next week. See you next week. Thanks for looking in. We certainly appreciate it. Stay well. The books will keep you alive. <coughs> Unlike that. <laughs> yeah. Is he dying? I don't understand. Is he dying? We'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>